welcome. I'm Katie Wyatt. I'm the executive director of El Sistema USA, and I'm really excited to be here this morning with three colleagues and friends in the world of music education and social change. Morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Adrian Taylor to our, sorry, Adrian Thompson to our far left. Adrian is the program manager of the Talent Development Program of the Atlanta Symphony, which is in its 25th year. Adrian has brought three of her own children through the Talent Development Program. She's the mother of eight. She's a retired public schools teacher in high where she taught high school orchestras. She's also a professional flautist and pianist and has her MBA from Indiana University. Walter Bittner is the Director of Education and Community Engagement for the Nashville Symphony. Walter has a rich background as a teacher, performer, and composer. He has uh, been a longtime teacher in kindergarten through 12th grade, public school teacher. He's also been with the Nashville Symphony since 2014. Also, Walter is a writer and has a blog called Off the Podium, which he keeps on his website if you're interested. It's walterbittner.com. And to my immediate left is Mr. Charles Dickerson, the founder, executive director, and conductor of IC Yola, the inner city youth orchestra of Los Angeles, which, was, which uh, Charles founded in 2009. He's also a composer and is best known for his work, I Have a Dream, for choir and orchestra, which was premiered uh, at the opening of the Martin Luther King Memorial on the National Mall in Washington, DC. We're here to talk about the importance of youth orchestras and uh, early development programs for young musicians in diversifying the pipeline into professional orchestras and into a professional music career and or creating positive citizens and contributors to our society. And is there a tension there? Is there a different way or, th or thinking that we should be approaching in uh, the way that we teach young people in orchestras to either pre prepare for professional careers and go on to become incredibly productive citizens? So we'd like to begin with each of our panelists sharing a little bit about their program and the work that they do in order to support this pipeline. And we're gonna start with Walter Bittner and the Nashville Symphony. So um, uh, I'm a, I came to the Nashville Symphony after, or after about nearly 25 years of teaching school. And um, yeah. And so when, when I began working there, um, that's not my slide. <laughs> so the that's it, that's it. So when I came to the Nashville Symphony, um, immediately uh, what, I, what I was asked to do was to um, find a way to use that experience, uh, especially working in public school systems, to help the Nashville Symphony address the um, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in, in a meaningful way. So uh, many of my students um, at National School of the Arts when I was the choir and orchestra director there um, were from a, a diverse range of ethnic backgrounds but did not necessarily have the preparation to be successful musicians uh, when they went to college that their middle class white counterparts did. And so that's what this, this program was designed to provide that, the, that support and create equity. So Great, and before we go too deeply into the program, we're just gonna tee up each of our work. I'd love to have Adrian share a little bit about your work in the talent development program and how you got started. We work with 25 students a year. They are between fifth grade and 12th grade and our mission is to take these students and to uh, deposit them on the doorsteps of the top conservatories and music schools in the country. So what we do is to prepare them, not only musically, but we try to prepare them so that they are uh, very familiar with the uh, classical musical world so that they know how to 
uh, have life skills that allows them to be able to be resilient and to be able to be adaptive and to be able to be successful so they know what to expect, not only when they get to the conservatories, but things that will be happening or potentially happening for them as they even leave the conservatories and the kind of challenges and hurdles that they will uh, need to navigate. So it's very, um, uh, very comprehensive. We have um, students that um, have gone to Curtis. We've had six students go to Curtis. We've had students go to Juilliard, to Oberlin, to uh, Northwestern, to University of Michigan, to uh, New England Conservatory, to, I should have written them down, but <laughs> awesome place. Indiana, uh, Jacobs School of Music. Um, and we have been around for 24 years and we are just kind of in the beginnings. We have a student now in New World Symphony. We have a student that has, um, is cellist in the Turtle Island String Quartet. We have one that has a, both a composing and soloist career, Xavier Foley. If you were here last year, you heard him perform. And we're just kind of in the beginning because we have had 83 students that have completed the program over this time, we started out with only 10, and of that, 26% of them are still uh, receiving their training, either undergraduate or graduate. So we're just in the beginning of seeing what the students are going to do and become. In That's the amazing, and we'll hear more about how specifically the talent development program works, but before then, I'd love to have Chuck Dickerson please share with us a little bit about how I See Yola got started and a bit about your background. Good morning to all of you. It's a delight to see you all. Thank you for being here this morning. It's a joy to participate uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the entire weekend in this capacity. It's my first time to actually have a chance to speak at a Sphinx Con, and I'm excited about it. <laughs> so uh, we are totally, totally different from all of these institutional guys, the people who grew up in the Nashville program or the Atlanta program. In 2009, a young man, a young African-American man, 16 years old, who was a bass player in Los Angeles, came to me and said, uh, Mr. Dickerson, we need to have a youth orchestra in the black community. And the reason for this, is, well, there's a billion reasons for it, and some of this we might get into later on. But he essentially said, you know, um, there are a group, a group of us who play, we think we play reasonably well, and we don't f have a place to play where we feel comfortable. Please keep those words in mind. So would you work with us this summer? So he brought eight of his friends. There were nine of us that started in June of 2009. By the end of that summer, I did no recruiting. The kids all went out. By the end of the summer, we had 24. We put on a little concert, put on a little recital. Um, we had about 150 people show up. <laughs> and after the end of the concert, the kids, uh, a nice little story. They invited me to a birthday party where I did not know I was actually being uh, bushwhacked, but I got there and they basically said, we want to keep this going and we want you to be our director. So I said, I will do no recruiting. You do the recruiting. Um, I'll, 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 I'll help you guys. Uh, it was really one of the points I'm trying to raise with you here is that this was organic from the young people. It was not institutionally driven. We are not an organization of the LA Phil. We're not an organization of the LA Chamber Orchestra. Although we have great relations with both of them, uh, this, was an this is an organization that was grown and birthed by the kids themselves. Uh, we now serve about 250 young people a year. Uh, we, uh, how much more am I going to talk about my program right now? Uh, you can All right. wrap it up. Wrap it up. <laughs> I'll tell you more as we get into it a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Thank Thanks. You. Before we really describe deeply how each of these programs supports the pipeline, I wanted to put us put, uh, provide some of our landscape of the youth orchestra world. If we could go to the top of the slides. All the way to the beginning. Thank you. Next slide. <laughs> Sorry, we had a little technical difficulty this morning. El Sistema USA is the movement for social change that works with uh, 20,000 youth across the country. Next slide. 
uh, just to give a landscape of the work that I do, we have 70 members of El Sistema USA, which are uh, joining the collective movement and contributing to one another as we grow. Next slide. This is some of our program data at a glance. We'll go deeper into El Sistema USA this afternoon, but just to give you a sense of who we are and um, the type of organizations that have joined us. Next slide. But to take a look at the average racial and gender breakdown in or El Sistema inspired programs, and these are predominantly kindergarten through the sixth grade programs, uh, we are majority Latino and black uh, youth programs in classical music settings. Next slide. And we're, uh, Aaron Dworkin shared some of these statistics at, at the top of his remarks opening the conference, and I thought it was um, interesting to note and important for us all to know the youth orchestra profile that um, our, our country enjoys, which is 15,000 students of 54 youth orchestras who participated in this survey, and they represent 4,500 schools across the country. Next slide. They're in nearly every state in the country. Next slide. But this is an, an interesting characteristic. So the youth breakdown, as opposed to adult orchestra breakdown for Latino and black musicians, it's much higher in youth orchestras. And one of the things that we want to talk about today is what's happening to those kids as they continue in their youth orchestra career move on to college or post-secondary education and either continue to pursue music as a, as a profession or do something else. Next slide. I also thought it was fascinating that money is not the issue. 94% of youth orchestras offer full scholarships for kids who want to participate. And so what is it that is keeping our youth orchestras from becoming the diverse um, cornucopia of our country. Next slide. And so to speak to that, we're going to hear specifically about the three programs introduced and then open it up to questions to talk about what, what are our purposes in the pipeline? Is it professionalism? Is it well-rounded citizenship? Is it both? What's important? I'd like to start with Walter. Thank you, Katie. Can we have the next slide? So uh, the mission of our Celerando program is to prepare gifted young musicians from ethnic, com diverse ethnic communities that are underrepresented in American orchestras um, to pursue, to go on to college and successfully pursue professional careers in classical music. And um, I'm not going to share the statistics about the current state of US orchestras as far as the diversity of, of ethnic um, backgrounds because I think we all know what that is. Next slide. So uh, the program was uh, basically, we, we researched it and designed it in the summer of 2015. And um, a, a, a very large part of that research was um, meeting this wonderful woman to my left here, Adrian Thompson, and, and learning from her experience and the, at that time about 20 years experience of the of the Atlanta Talent Development Program. We're very fortunate in Nashville. Atlanta is really only about four hours away by car. And so um, they're really our sister program and, and have inspired and, and helped us in so many ways. So we were very lucky to acquire funding for to launch the program this year. And we be began recruiting in the beginning of, of 2016, had our first auditions in March that year. And the, the audition program process is about five months long with many, many steps in it. Um, and we found, found it very successful in identifying the right students. And our first class started in the fall of 2016. Uh, we ha next month, we'll have our third set of auditions for our third class. Next slide, please. Um, we, we in the, at the end of 2015, we, require, we acquired a $959,000 grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to fund 75% of the um, first six years of the launch, so that we this we're, we're incrementally growing the program um, up to a capacity of 24 students uh, by 2020. Next slide, please. Um, one of the one of the most important parts of, of the success of getting this program off the ground was convincing others in our community that it was important. So I spent a lot of time 
working with the Blair School of Music, which is the conservatory at Vanderbilt, in our, in our own town, um, Music Makes Us, which is the branded music education program at Nashville Metro Public Schools, Conexion Americas, which is a immigrant um, assimilation nonprofit in Nashville that helps um, people who come to Nashville from other countries and other cultures uh, become American citizens, and Choral Arts Link, which is um, an independent community youth choir that's run by uh, the most prominent um, African-American music educator in Nashville. And then we were very fortunate last year to begin a partnership with New World Symphony, uh, who do monthly master classes with their fellows and, their, and our students via internet to distance learning technology. Next slide, please. So there was our that's a photo of our first class with their teachers. Um, and um, their te all, one of the fundamental aspects of our program is that the teachers of, at Cello Rondo are members of the Nashville Symphony. And uh, we now have nine students. Next slide. The, the program components, which was um, in, for the most part modeled on the Atlanta TDP program, include weekly private lessons with those teachers. They take weekly music theory classes, and if they complete the theory, um, program, then they're offered the opportunity to take music history classes at Blair School of Music. They're required to play in a community youth orchestra as well as their school band or orchestra. They, um, they get the opportunity to attend most of our symphony's classical uh, series concerts. They have performance opportunities throughout the year. We help them go to summer camps and festivals in the summer, and then when they are in juniors and seniors, we help them with preparing for their college auditions and going to visit those schools, and they play in the monthly master classes with New World. Next slide. Can I get one? Okay. And, um, and that's what a weekly lesson looks like, and I think we're going to stop there so everybody else has a chance to go on. Oh, I do? Okay. Then let's go on, see if we can get through what, what is left. There's not much more. So those are the demographics of Nashville. And, and Nashville's a very, um, we, we have a, we have, we're gonna become a, a minority majority city very soon. And we have a, a big range of um, ethnic diversity in Nashville. So when we were designing the program, we had, to, the goal was to try to make uh, the demographics of the students in the program look like our community. So um, we chose to accept students who are not represented in U.S. orchestras ethnically, which are people who are white and people who are of North Asian background, Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. We accept students of all other ethnic diversities. Next slide. So our current enrollment includes uh, students from all of these ethnic backgrounds. And it, and it continues to, the um, application pool continues to grow and be even more diverse each year. So it, in fact, does our students do reflect the diversity of our own community. Um, we've had some challenges, and we've been lucky that because this is a group effort to, for the most part, find some solutions to those challenges to through creative thinking and, and finding more people to help us. And uh, these are some of the achievements of our students over the, just the last two years. Um, and we're, we're very proud of, so far, the trajectory of the program. The design seems to be pretty successful. And uh, we'll graduate our first student uh, a year from this spring in 2019. Next slide. And um, now this is the pe where we've been going out to talk about it. And that, I think we'll stop right there because that's where we're at. Sphinx. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Great. Mr. Dickerson, please share. Well, thank you again. So. <laughs> Walter, we're, we're so different in uh, the context of uh, how our organization works. Uh, you've talked about um, uh, audition process, application process, serving as a pipeline. The Inner City Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles was not created as a deliberate attempt to try to prepare young people to play in professional orchestras. To some extent, that has evolved and emerged, and I'm going to take a little bit of a personal liberty, liberty right now and tell you that one of our members is currently sitting in the audience. She's Delaney Harris. Delaney's in her stand-up. Delaney, would you please? Delaney's in her second year now at Eastman, uh, and she is preparing for a professional career in... Um, at, she is a, uh, preparing for her second, uh, preparing for a uh, professional career as a bass uh, uh, player. Um, hopefully one of your orchestras are, will pick her up at some point. Um, but we did not deliberately start as a pipeline for um, 
uh, professional orchestras, we don't have an audition process. We don't have an, uh, uh, an application process. Let me tell you, basically, what happens with us is I get a phone call or I get an email. I'm looking for a place for my child to play in a youth orchestra. Can we come? And my response is typically, our next rehearsal is Sunday night at 6.30 at Knox Presbyterian Church. Here's the address. Please bring your, stu your child and bring, your, and bring the instrument. The minute that child walks in the, fa in the door, they are family to us. I don't care the level of their ability to play. We seat them in the section, typically with the violinists. We put them in the second violin section. We try to pair them with somebody else who's probably been playing with us for a while so they can Im easily, and pick, easily and immediately pick up the music. But we don't go through an audition process. We don't go through an application process. Um, we, they're, they're, um, we do not represent a school. We're totally independent. We don't represent, uh, let's see, I wrote down a couple other notes. Um, so, essentially, uh, when young people come to join our orchestra, uh, one of the reasons they come, and I think we're going to talk about this when you ask me the question later on, one of the reasons they come is because they find that there are lots of youth orchestras around Los Angeles. But I want you to hear this and hear it well. None of them, except ours, is in the African-American community. So in order for a youth, a young person, to play in a youth orchestra, unless they're playing in ours, they have to travel, they have to get out of their community, they have to go to places where they are unfamiliar, they have to deal with people with whom they are unfamiliar, they have to deal, frankly, with cultures with which they are unfamiliar, and then <laughs> they go and <sighs> kind of feel like, well, I'm not sure if I belong here. Then they find us, and we try to make it as family as possible. There's one other critical element, because I see you picking up the, uh, the microphone. Our program is without charge. We do not charge our young people. Nobody pays to be a part of our family. Once you walk in the door, you're in. We do find, uh, it's fallen on me to find the funding to make all this happen. Uh, but you need me to stop, don't you? Well, I was going to say, now that we've introduced the idea, mm -hmm. tell us more about why you feel like people leave Okay. So, as we were preparing for this panel, thank you, Katie. Um, as we were preparing for this panel, I, I seem to have her heard in my mind somewhere, maybe it was just me, but I thought that one of the issues we were going to talk about uh, is why um, young people drop out of orchestra, particularly young people of color drop out of orchestra. And so, I, I just wanted to share a story with you. I had the privilege of being at the El Sistema Conference two weeks ago at Duke University, and thank you for that, Katie. I had the privilege of speaking there as well. And at the conclusion of my presentation, I had a young lady walk up to me. Uh, well, not, well, she actually sent me an email. I'm going to read some of this to you. I, yeah, that's, there it is. She says, Mr. leave it right there, please. Dear Mr. Dickerson, it was a pleasure meeting you, blah, blah, blah. I didn't have the opportunity to share this with you, but I was a violinist for 10 years during my childhood and adolescence. She goes on. I wrote her back and said, I'd like to know more about your violin playing. Are you still playing? Blah, blah, blah. Here's what she wrote back. Hi, Chuck. As far as my experience, I haven't picked up my violin in about 10 years. I quit after I graduated high school because as much as I enjoyed it, I didn't see a future for myself. This is a black young lady. One salient issue you addressed at the symposium is the importance of the visibility of leaders of color in the classical music realm. I started playing the violin in school when I was eight years old. Um, it was a wonderful, Brazilian opportunity. My orchestra teacher was gentle and patient in his instruction. I played alongside a diverse group of students in a community that was nurturing and exciting. But all of that changed once I arrived in middle school. Over the next eight years, I found that although I still loved playing, I wasn't passionate, I wasn't having fun or creating beautiful music, I wasn't in a supportive community or a safe place to be expressive or experimental. I felt like my orchestra conductor didn't care about me or even like me. She didn't see me. I didn't feel comfortable in this community. For the first time, I was alone. There was no sense of community, just competition. I was the only student of color in my class for years and it took away a sense of belonging that I yearned for. As the years passed, my peers were excelling at astounding rates. This was largely influenced by their enrollment in private lessons, something my family couldn't afford at the time. We could do an entire weekend just about these issues. Um, but this young lady's writing to me really kind of set forth really common stories and factors uh, about why young people drop out of orchestra. 
And I want you to know that my mantra, and I'm going to close with this, my mantra has been that every city in which there is a professional sports franchise, I don't care what it is, needs to have an inner city youth orchestra. And by this I mean they need to have, we need to have a place in the African American Latino community where young people can go to actually play, uh, they can actually play their instruments so that they're not having to travel 20 miles uh, outside of their, their own community. Uh, to, uh, to participate with a bunch of people who don't look like them, who do, they don't know, uh, who they have no cultural uh, likeness with. Um, and so I, I urge and strongly urge, I really strongly urge that every city have an inner city youth orchestra. Uh, you will find that you'll have a bunch of young kids in there of color. That, and these are you know, supposedly the hot issues of our industry today. Uh, who will want to play and who will play just beautifully. Uh, our orchestra plays, uh, can you go back to one of the other slides? Uh, we, we present a series of, uh, eight, of six to eight concerts every year. Keep going back, please. Yeah, keep going back. Here we are in performance at the Walt Disney Concert Hall. There's 100 kids right there. 90% um, of those kids are kids, 95% of those kids are kids of color. They are primarily middle school, high school, in some young college age. Um, and they come right out of the community. And I think, really, you know, when our industry talks about ha wanting to have people, young people of color, here they are. They are there. We do exist. We just don't always exist in the same community that you exist in. Uh, and we'd like to find a way to make that merge. And I encourage the way to make it merge is by creating even new institutions within the community where these young people live. What a great call to action. Thank you so much, Chuck. We'd love to hear more now about the specifics of the talent development program, which is our final slide. Thank you. Ms. Adrienne Thompson. So one of the uh, pillars of our program is that we do require our students to be in an enrichment orchestra, and it serves um, more than one purpose, and all of those help to contribute to the development of our student. So one of the things that it does is that we have students who often, in their home environment, they will feel isolated in a different way than what um, Ms. Dickerson has explained because they are in, say, an African-American environment, but they like classical music, and it makes them kind of stick out in a different, in a different way. So oftentimes they are the one that's different or they are the nerd of their school. And by participating in an enrichment orchestra, what happens is they get to be in a room full of nerds. And even though they may be culturally different, they do have something in common that allows them to feel like um, they have a place and that their passion is not really that strange after all, because there are other people who also enjoy that. The other thing that happens is that all of a sudden what we have done is taken our students into a place where if they are, say, the best students within inside the walls of their orchestra room or within inside the walls of their band room, then all of a sudden they are in a position where they may not be the best one anymore. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there is an extra incentive for them to do and experience some of the things that they see other people in the orchestra doing. And in Atlanta, we have many, many youth symphonies. And so there is, kind of a tier of progression as the student progresses, they can do, uh, continue to go up. We do have 
um, a component that is similar, an inner city uh, youth orchestra. And then we have another metropolitan youth orchestra, and we have an Emory orchestra, and we have uh, the Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra. And so our students are able to see how they are progressing in the continuum because they will have an entry point here, but then as they continue to progress, then they will see that they can get an entry point into the next group or the next group up. And most of our students, our objective is that they would be in um, the Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra, which is one of the ones that would be kind of at the top, um, a top in terms of uh, the literature that performed and um, having some of the best musician, youth musicians in the city so that they can start to see um, that they're getting um, better. And the other thing that happens is that the same way that they needed to get outside of the walls of their classroom in order to see that there's a bigger world out there, we also even have to get them outside of the walls of the Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra in order for them to start understanding that there is a national and an international uh, competition that we are preparing them for because that is our objective for them when they are in this program. So as they go through, then even like our all-state orchestras, um, that's a external marker. I call these external markers. So an external marker, if they get into this youth symphony, it's an external marker that they have uh, made progress that corroborates that. When they get into Allstate, another external marker. Allstate is not what is going to prepare them for a career, but it's an external marker that they are progressing through and the peers that we want them to be at the same level at so that when it comes time for, again, us to put them at the doorsteps of the conservatories, they know that they are competitive. You know, I tell them we send them to camp, and I tell them that while you're sleeping, somebody on the other side of the world is practicing. <laughs> and so <laughs> after they've gone to camp, they believe me <laughs> because and they have met those students. Adrian, just to ask a couple specific mm -hmm. questions, the talent development program, why did it begin at the Atlanta Symphony? And is it uh, master classes and private lessons and chamber music and full ensembles? Okay, so um, it began because people looked out in the audience at the Atlanta Symphony and saw that there were no colored people coming to the concerts. And a volunteer group associated with the symphony um, under the leadership of Azira G. Hill said one of the ways for us to get um, people of color in the audience would be if we were to have a program where we taught lessons and also if we gave the families free tickets to the Atlanta Symphony concerts, mm -hmm. then we would have their families in the audience. And the objective at that time was to give lessons so that those students would also be able to audition into the youth symphony so that we would have students of color in the um, Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra, or the ASYL. And what happened was, as the students came into the program, all of a sudden they said, oh, I didn't know they could do that, mm -hmm. or I didn't know they could do that. And so then the program grew as the children grew. Mm -hmm. They started getting into Allstate. They started winning concerto competitions. They started, and we had to step up what was being done uh, in order to meet the growth of the students. And then all of a sudden, it was kind of like, let's make this something that is a standard component of what we're trying to do for every student that's in the program. 
That's amazing. And to just highlight one of the first student, the first student in the talent development program to get a job in a professional orchestra was Adrian's son, Eric Thompson, who plays bass in the Charlotte Symphony. So when she says the students really made a difference, what she means is like also her children really <laughs> made a difference. <laughs> And I'd Absolutely. like to point out just one thing, mm -hmm. and that is because we are in a position where the, uh, uh, the youth orchestra and the talent development program are under the same kind of umbrella, we are able to negotiate things for the students that are also things that point them towards professional careers, which is what is mm -hmm. on the slide. Mm -hmm. So the soloists that come to the symphony, mm. we try to negotiate that they're going to do a master class with the youth musicians. Mm. And so we have are supplementing uh, just the participation in the uh, group with the things that you see there. The uh, master classes, if they're interested in chamber music, this is optional. They can uh, have that experience. Uh, we have a partnership with New World Symphony, just as Nashville, that exposes our students to the things that they can offer. They just did a mock audition in a residency for our, the seniors that are auditioning for uh, music schools. Uh, that little last piece tells about where we are trying to shape the whole musician by uh, having them, a performance psychologist come in and talk to them about anxiety and effective practice and those kind of things so that we can prepare them as much as uh, possible for what is to come. Great. I'd like to open the floor to questions at this point, and I'll kick us off in this discussion. We've just heard three incredible examples, in, and of course, including the El Sistema-inspired programs across the country, that are pushing kids, pushing kids in classical music, pushing kids in orchestras. Um, to what end? We, we've spoken about students who have gotten jobs in professional orchestras, We've spoken about kids who don't go on to, to pursue professional orchestras. Walter, I'd love to start with you. To what end? So the question um, that was posed to me for this session was, um, is the role of the youth orchestra to prepare students for a professional career as orchestral musicians? Or is the role of the youth orchestra to prepare st students for life in a diversity of careers? and to give them a social environment and to provide other kinds of aspects, educational objectives. And my answer is yes. Mm -hmm. It's both of those things. And, and, and there's a tremendous variety uh, among youth orchestras around the country and in different communities. And um, it, it really depends on your community. In Nashville, we have five youth orchestras. And as Adrian described about the Atlanta uh, Symphony Youth Orchestra, um, the Curb Youth Symphony, which is the, the um, most advanced of the three at Blair School of Music, um, most of the students in that, or many of the students in that youth orchestra do wish to go on and, and pursue professional careers, or at least compete and sit in the stands next to others who are doing that. But many of the other youth orchestras provide a lot of the other objectives. And, and, and are specifically not for students who are doing that, although most of them do have kids who end up pursuing it. Um, in smaller communities where there may not be five youth orchestras, then it's tougher because the youth orchestra has to provide both those sets of objectives. Mm. Adrian and Chuck, do you want to respond to that same question at all? Or we could open it up. Do you have anything else you want to add? I agree with him, yes and Great. yes. Great, yeah. <laughs> same. Great. Sir. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Charles Babatu Murphy, St. Louis. I'm a career and technical education teacher in St. Louis Public Schools, but it's amazing that music is not part of our mm -hmm. career and technical education curriculum. But my, my question uh, for, for everybody, uh, as far as Nashville, I know TSU is there, and uh, I used to get down there a lot, and I'm wondering how much you are working, say, with the, the cultural, uh, the, the different cultural organizations that exist around TSU to actually uh, get some music programs in the communities 
because to me, and then this dovetails to LA, uh, which are inner city youth orchestra and Knox Presbyterian Church. Um, what I've been finding uh, way back, because I've been around for a little minute, way back, uh, kids would come to public school and you could get an instrument, you can pick an instrument to start learning to play. It's not happening now, but I did find that churches tend to be incubators for uh, young musicians. Um, so, so that's basically my question is around how do we, how can we set up these types of interactions to one, to get the instruments in the hands of the kids when they're still young. Yeah. So Could you describe any of the church-based partnerships that you might have? Well, thank you for the question. I, I do not recall, and I should know this, is TCU, uh, or TSU, is that HBCU? Yes. Yeah. Uh, HBCU, for those of you who do not know, is historically black college and university. Just so, you know, the record's a little clear here, most black colleges do not have orchestra programs. Many of them have marching band programs. Most of them do not have uh, orchestra programs. And one of the reasons for this is because the instruments do not get into the hands of the young people. The orchestral instruments, particularly the strings, don't get into the hands of the young people at a young age. Or if they do, as Adrian was saying, you know, sometimes they, they get into a program and then... Um, uh, they might be seen as being unusual or odd, and so therefore some of them drop out. Um, I think that if we create organizations within our communities, like based in the churches, okay, so <laughs> here's, a whole nother, here's a whole nother session, how to do this, how to create an inner city youth orchestra. And the way to do it is basically you go into your city, you find a pastor of a church, and you tell him, we, we, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, we, the San Francisco Orchestra, whatever, we want to create the Cincinnati Orchestra. We want to create a youth orchestra in your basement. You think he's going to say no? Uh, and then you just, you know, you bring in some instruments, and you bring in a teacher or two, and the pastor will bring you more kids than you can handle. And in the next two weeks, you'll have a youth orchestra of some kind going on. It's just a matter of being a little bit creative and thinking outside of the box. It's a matter of going to where the people are as opposed to expecting the people to come to you. And the churches are ideal places for this, particularly in the black community. Adrian. One of the things that was helpful as our program evolved is that the Atlanta University Center, which, con which is Morehouse College and Spelman College and um, Clark Atlanta, one of the things that they did it was they hired TDP students to play in the AU Center Orchestra for the same reason that he mentioned. They had a small number of string players. They wanted to provide performance opportunities for them. But one of the things that happened was that they needed to supplement the musicians. Do you know how empowering it was for our kids? All of a sudden now, they would usually have like three rehearsals and a performance, and they were getting $50 for coming to an orchestra rehearsal. Mm -hmm. They would earn $200 for each series. All of a sudden, the light bulb went off in these kids' mind. You can earn money playing music. Mm -hmm. So actually, while we helped them, they probably helped us more then uh, we helped them. And the other thing that happened is that they brought in uh, Tahira Whittington and they brought in um, Melissa White and they brought in soloists. So all of a sudden, not only were our students earning money, but they were always also seeing uh, musicians of color who were pursuing this as a career and who were accomplished. And all of a sudden, it was like, I can do that too. That's awesome. Next question. This is a question from Slido. Um, they asked, can you give advice to those who see, hope to seek funding from institutions such as the Mellon Foundation? It often feels daunting for um, smaller teams. Walter, I'll, do I'll you want to start? Yeah. Who secured a Mellon Foundation grant? Um, I, my advice to you would be to move forward with your project and and have clarity about what your goals and objectives are that you want to accomplish, and um, and who that program is going to serve, but especially who what the what the goal of the project is, and then network and meet people, 
and talk to people who have already gone that path before you, and I'll be here through Sunday night. Okay. <laughs> I'm real quickly also, you'd be surprised how much your local elected officials, particularly those of color, can and will help if you ask them to. The thing is, they, don't, they can't dig in their own pockets and use public funds, but they have connections. Each one of them ran for office. And when they ran for office, they went to a bunch of people and said, hey, we're, uh, you know, I'm running for office, please support me. Go to, those go to your city council member and say, join with us, be partners with us, help us do a fundraiser with your fundraiser, with your funders, and um, hopefully people will come write little checks for you. You can raise money this way. Good morning, I'm Ahmad Mays, uh, Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. Um, so we're starting a program that we've, very similar to actually modeled after TDP and Manichella Rondo, uh, getting into that area of work, and the program is, is in its infancy right now. Um, I guess the question I wanted to ask is, our program, there are no financial requirements. Um, any student who shows the, the, the talent, the drive, and um, uh, you know, has the, the, the family backing and support and meets the you know, other qualifications for the program can get in, um, whether they're rich or in between. Um, one, what are your program's financial requirements, if any? Uh, what role do fi uh, family finances play in um, being accepted in your programs? And what are some of the perceptions um, that you get you know, based on what your um, policies are? I'll start with Sistema programs. The El Sistema movement is a targeted initiative in changing the face of poverty. So it's overwhelmingly kids who qualify for free and reduced lunch. Maybe the talent development program next. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we don't ask for any information, meaning that um, when our kids um, come into the program during the audition process, I don't even have information about what their parents' occupations are. Okay. So um, when they come in, it is basically because of the student's musical potential. But this is what I do. As part of the audition process, I go and visit each family in their right. home. And what that does is that they, it gives me kind of an idea um, where they are economically, and what that does is allow me to know who is going to need a little bit extra support. So, um, and that's when I start to find out things because it has to be a whole family interview. Everybody that's in the family has to be there. And that's when I start to find out things about, you know, family structure um, and, you know, um, I don't know, you know, I go to visit a family and I find out that somebody in the family is deaf or, mm. um, you know, all the, those kind of things. So we do not discriminate against rich people. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> <laughs> and at some point our program may evolve that in order to serve more students, we may be asking those who have more resources to pay something towards their mm -hmm. instruction, which would allow us, if we have, you know, three or four or five people who are paying something into the program, and it's enough to um, allow us to be able to bring in one more student who um, needs support, then I can see that happening in the future. Walter and Chuck, you wanted to share briefly so we yeah. can answer um, your question. Our, our, situ our situation is almost identical to Atlanta TDP. We do not ask for financial information, but we do a very holistic um, picture of the family. We look for three things, motivation, talent, and family support for our student success. We, uh, our, our program is totally free to our kids, so we don't even ask about money. It's not even... We go out and we raise the money that is necessary to sustain our program from others. Um, we like to rob from the rich to pay the poor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kalida. Good morning. My name is Kalida Jones, and I'm the artistic director of Bravo Waterbury, which is an El Sistema inspired program in Waterbury, Connecticut. I know, Connecticut, but you'd be surprised. Um, <clears throat> We actually have the highest equity issues in the country, and yet the richest people reside in Connecticut. So it's very interesting. Uh, we actually 
we don't charge the families, but we do have a registration fee of $25. And for me personally, um, I grew up in the DC Youth Orchestra, so I'm an alumnus of that program, but that <laughs> level of personal accountability is so crucial. And I found the first two years, we didn't charge anything, not a registration fee or anything of that nature. But when we decided to do the registration fee, I started to notice a personal sense of accountability, not only from the kids, but from their parents. Because even if they're giving $5 a month or you know, $2.50 a week, they, they, they have ownership and they start taking more ownership. And kudos to Adrian. We also have an ambassadors program where our students actually have to sign a contract with me. They have to clock in just like the teachers. And they do get a, um, a Visa gift card at the end of the year, of completion of the year, because I want to show them that when you work and when you're accountable and when you're consistent, there is a payout that comes out of that. And so then they start shifting their mindset. Um, you know, people always assume that families that are in programs like ours, they are just looking for a free handout, but really they're just looking for something better, a pipeline and access to opportunity. So my question to Charles is, how do you see, do you see um, challenges with some of your families who it's free, all they have to do is make a phone call um, because I, pers I believe, my parents who worked very hard, we had to play the sliding scale for the DC Youth Orchestra, but I believe that you gotta do so, you gotta fill out some paperwork. Like you, you've gotta show me that you're, you're invested in this. And I, please don't take this as me attacking, but I just wanna know, you know. Before you respond, actually, I'd love to perhaps combine Kalita's questions sure. with the two remaining questions, and then that'll be all the time we have. So we've got accountability. We're gonna specifically ask Charles about that. Yes. Okay, my name is Erica Locke Williams. I'm actually, I wear a number of hats besides being a mom. Uh, I'm a board member for Young Singers of the Palm Beaches, Youth Orchestra, Palm Beach County, Faith's Place Center for the Creative Arts. And my day job is I'm a professor of music at Palm Beach State College. Awesome. Now, my question, and this, all of you may be able to help me out. Uh, my question, and it, it deals with my own personal experiences as well is we have quite a few youth orchestras in our area. Uh, we have a couple of uh, elite public, uh, we call them public private schools of the performing arts where students have to audition to get in. And one thing that I noticed where we have a lot of young uh, youth programs, once they get to that middle school age and for that talented student that now it's time to raise the, the quality of instrument and so forth, then we start to lose them. And that led to my daughter, who's 17 years old. She's a Sphinx alum. She's a Sphinx entrepreneur who started her own foundation, Caminade Strings, to where she collects old instruments and donates them to the talented kids. And she actually started making her own instruments last year. Wow. But what do we do for those kids that now it's time to step their game up? Because when my daughter needed her instrument and my husband, who's not a musician, was like, you got to be kidding me what the cost, you know, and but for her Nana, you know, she wouldn't have a That's quality a great instrument. Question. What do we do for those targeted kids to get them quality instruments? That's an awesome question. And then we'll take our final question and then we'll answer them and thank you everyone for coming. Good morning, my name is Karen Cueva. I work for Carnegie Hall. Um, I'm interested in the percentage breakdown between um, youth of color in youth orchestras and comparing that to the professional youth orchestra realm. Um, I'm curious to know uh, the ways in which your programs are preparing many of these students who perhaps may be first generation college students, who perhaps may be um, financial providers for their family at a very young age. Um, how are you preparing them as they enter into the post-secondary education for the major acquisition of student loans, Oof. coupled with um, entry-level salaries in professional orchestras that oftentimes are very low and when you're coming from a low socioeconomic background and you have to support your family. Um, how are you preparing those students not only for the character and moral education as well as for the high level of instructional training but for the fiscal barriers that may be um, the things that encourage them to leave the field. Awesome. Thank you. Why don't we start with the accountability question and share and if you have any thoughts about um, this question of pushing kids to the next level and the costs that sure. they will take on. Let me at least respond way. to number one and three. I don't know if I can respond to number two in all this time, but for number one and number three, I have pretty much the same answer, and it's pr pretty much this. We require our young people to pursue excellence. Now, 
what this means is that, yeah, we don't, uh, certainly we have to fulfill certain legal requirements about people filling out paperwork, and we do that. But in the context of people necessarily paying into the program something, money, in order to participate, we have had culture, we've had battles within my own board of directors about whether that we should pursue that course or not. We grew out of, an, uh, of, a, of, a, of a situation where young people came and said, we want to start, and there was no money. And so I have been one of the big barriers to the idea of not charging, and respectfully to all those who think otherwise, as long as I'm involved with it, we're not going to charge our young people. As long as they pursue excellence, as long, and that is the payoff. Uh, if, if, uh, with regard to, I, I'm going to try to merge this with your question with number three. Um, how do we get our young, see, so often, particularly in the African American community, if it's real or not, there is a perception that there is a lack of excellence within our communities. And we require that our young people, we don't play reductions. We don't play arrangements. We play the actual scores. So if you walk into an orchestra, into our orchestra, and you have uh, Beethoven V, for example, as what we're playing, you're going to have to up your game to understand that you, you're going to you're gonna have to be better than what you are. There's another little uh, uh, implicit pressure here, and Delaney can talk about this one day. Talk to her if you want to. But you know what? We end our season at the Walt Disney Concert Hall every year. 2,000 people. On April 4, we have a Martin Luther King Day, a uh, Martin Luther King assassination program at, in the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles. 3,000 people will be there. The vast majority of them will be the leaders of the African American community. I happen to believe that part of what happens is these young people walk in to these halls and see all these people from their community looking to them to be excellent. That costs them. Um, in my view, it costs them, uh, it costs them giving up a Game Boy and instead you know, putting in some, some rehearsal time. Um, I can't talk a whole lot more about this because our time is really up. Um, geez, we need five more sessions Great. on this. I know, I know. If you could d uh, just say a couple of words about accountability, and I think the question is linked, our accountability to the kids and then our accountability. What are we doing mm -hmm. to make sure once we prepare them, they're successful all the way through? Well, our program I would say that it is at no cost to the parents, but if you were to bring one of the students in here and interview them, they would say, what do you mean? I have to practice 10 hours a week. I have to uh, go to, um, I have to be in my school program. I have to go to eight orchestra concerts. I have to play in a youth orchestra. I have to write concert reports. I have to uh, perform at a jury and I have to come in here and sit with you so you can tell me what I need to still be doing, no matter how good it was, I still need to be doing more. And that accountability is built into the program because if they don't do those things, guess what happens? It's, it's our program is not the right fit for them. And so therefore, by holding them to the requirements then that takes care of the whether or not um, they are going to take advantage of the opportunity that we're offering them or not. So if it's not right, then we give them a glass of water and we send them <laughs> on their way and we allow another student to take advantage of it. So it's not an issue in terms of instruments. Usually I start begging the parents <clears throat> when they first get in the program, you realize that you're going to have to buy blah, blah, blah. And then at the next advisory, yes, we have to do so-and-so. And usually it would take me probably a year of kind of prepping the parent before it's actually the time when they have to get the instrument. Uh, we will div uh, distribute GoFundMe campaigns to our uh, email list. Um, so we end up doing whatever it takes for that particular family for them to be able to get um, what they need. Every once in a while, you know, someone will come in and say, I'd like to help somebody. We had one student that only went to camp for two weeks at um, BUTI Tanglewood rather than stay in the whole session because they had to come back and earn money to buy a tuba and they need two tubas to go to college. And when they got up to $4,000, then 
somebody said, okay, I will pay the rest of it. But they wanted that child, to, they were prepared, but they wanted that child to have the experience of having some skin in the game. So it works out. I don't know how it's gonna work out in advance, but we always, because we are mindful of what kids need, we are always in a position that when it comes to the time that they need it, then we figure out a way to make it happen and it has never not happened. And I could not tell you in advance how it was gonna work out, but it always does. Walter, do you wanna quickly have the last word? Um, yeah, I actually two, two quick last words. One is that um, I, I agree with Adrian that, uh, that um, w we shouldn't let our, our um, perception of the fiscal challenges for, doing, for, for our young people of color to pursue these, this career, to stand in the way of them making every effort. It is a very daunting career to go into. There are a lot of obstacles for every child that goes into it. There are, but I'm very hopeful that, you know, despite what we see in the headlines, there are many, many people in this country who want to create equity. And, and those doors have been opening. And, and um, the other thing that I, that's very relevant to the discussion that I just want to make sure that everybody in this room knows about is that we also have a new national youth orchestra program out, out of Carnegie Hall that was started just a couple of years ago and there's NYO2 as well. And this is part of our pipeline for students who are going to professional youth orchestras. Thanks. Thank you so much for all you do for our youth and thank you all for your great questions. Enjoy the rest of conference. Thank you to Sphinx.